Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel. I'm Ed Baker, and I am your host producer. Thank you for joining us today. Today, we're in for a treat. We have a distinguished guest, Dr. Dan Ciccarone. Thank you, doctor, so much for being on the show. It's a pleasure, Ed. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yes. Dr. Ciccarone is a recognized international scholar on the medical, public health, and public policy dimensions of substance use, risk, and consequences. He's the Justin Minor Endowed Professor of Addiction Medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. For over 20 years, Dr. Dan, as he's called, has been actively involved in expanding the use of clinical harm reduction technologies and services. And that means naloxone, buprenorphine, drug checking, and as we'll see later on in this show, overdose prevention sites. He's provided harm reduction-based clinical services at several San Francisco syringe exchanges and was on the board of directors for the San Francisco Homeless Youth Alliance. He's been principal or co-investigator on numerous National Institute of Health sponsored public health research projects, including his current synthetics in combination also known as SYNC study. And uh, doctor, I will look forward uh, to seeing your publications on that study. Thank you. You know, um, I guess, you know, we know in America now that there's been a mounting uh, 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 drug overdose fatality for around 39 or 40 years. <clears throat> so it's nothing new, uh, tragic, but not new. For the purposes of our show, I would like to first go back to around 2013, 2014, the uh, CDC uh, morbidity and mortality weekly review of that time pointed out what I'd like you to focus on as the, the first two waves of the epidemic we see today, namely prescription opioids and its confluence with, with heroin. Just let's talk a little bit about what happened back there, 2013, 2014. Yeah, so we've, we're in what's called, a, uh, what I've called the triple wave epidemic of mortality, uh, where uh, deaths due to prescription opioids uh, occur during a, uh, an excess supply. Um, we could talk about the reasons for that. Um, since about 2000 to 2010, a flood of pills uh, many of which were legit, you know, for patient needs, but some of which made made it out to the street. Uh, that caused a upswell of use and upswell of, 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 of consequences, including deaths. And then we said, oh, my God, we're prescribing too many pills. We need prescription guidelines. We need prescription drug monitoring programs. We need to control the doctors and the nurse practitioners who are who are who are responsible for this. We need to cut down the illegitimate practices like the pill mills. And we did all of that as humans do, uh, en masse, uh, in sync. And then the supply of pills on the street and the supply of pills to some legitimate patients as well uh, started to go away. And that led to wave two, uptick in heroin use, a um, uh, uptick in heroin consequences. This happens around uh, 2011, 2012. Yeah. Um, and based on my um, summation of a lot of data, there's not enough heroin to go and meet the needs of people who are now in this kind of zone where they can't get, uh, uh, they, 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 they're dependent on, on the opioid pills, they can't get them. They're switching over to heroin, there isn't enough heroin. And this is where the bomb happens. And the bomb is fentanyl. Fentanyl comes in as a substitute for heroin, as an adulterant of heroin, right? So we have fentanyl adulterated or substituted heroin that hits the streets, particularly in Vermont, particularly in your Northeast neighbors, particularly in the Midwest and down to the Mid-Atlantic. Yeah. And that's as of 20, late 2013, 2014. And what do we see? We see mortality skyrocket. And we're still in that era. As of the latest data from the CDC, uh, the fentanyl wave continues. The last 12 months, we've lost 100,000 Americans uh, due to drug overdose, 
a, a, a vast majority of those are due to opioids, including uh, fentanyl. You know, it's, it's very, um, you know, I hate to use the word interesting because the word interesting, you know, it, it kind of cuts out the, the tragic heartbreak of everything that's happening. But, but it's, it's captivating to, to look at the process. And I want to look at it a little bit with you. I want to, I want to focus on the, um, the velocity, the acceleration. You know, if, if we look back to this 2013, 2014, that was when the governor of Vermont, Governor Shumlin, focused his whole state of the state address mm -hmm. on opioids. It was unprecedented. Yeah what was happening here in Vermont. It, it was impressive is what it was. That was an yeah. impressive political move. Yeah, yeah. And, and back then, the number for uh, the 2014 CDC report was it was 28,647. The number was just burned in my heart. And um, what's interesting is that was a, a combination mainly of prescri prescription drug overdose deaths, as you mentioned heroin overdose deaths, as you just mentioned. And in that, in that particular report, and I'm sure you, you, know, you know this, Doctor, but I just want to say it for the audience, because it speaks to velocity. In that report, it was, fentanyl was actually noted as a, a footnote. Fentanyl was noted, there was a, it says, quote, there was a rate of deaths involving illicit acetylfentanyl nearly doubled between 2013 and 2014. Now, I have a report from the um, Drug Enforcement Administration from 2015 talking about that same period. And they say, fentanyl and its analogs are responsible for more than 700 deaths across the United States between late 2013 and late 2014. 700 deaths. So 700 of the 28,647 were fentanyl. And, and that's what I mean. I'd like you to focus on that a little bit. So between 13, 2013 and 2014, 700. And, you know, focus on that, the velocity. What's happened me, between 2014 and 2020? Yeah, let me, let, me, let me show some graphics. So if I could share my screen, I have some... Um, images that will help. Okay, so what we're looking at here is U.S. mortality data for the last century. Um, 100 years of, of, of the U.S. Uh, death rate, deaths per 1,000 people. And we see 100 years ago, we had an epidemic of a, of a, of a flu virus, uh, the, the so-called Spanish flu. It's, it's poorly named, has nothing to do with Spain. It's just that Spain at the time had some of the best records in Europe, and so it looked like it started in Spain, but it's not true. Um, mm -hmm. But it was a strong influenza virus. Um, uh, the human immune system wasn't ready for it, and it killed an extraordinary number of people. So we see a spike uh, in deaths. Mm -hmm. 100 years later, oh, so then we have, we have 100 years of mm -hmm. declining uh, mortality due to technological advances in healthcare and, and, and safe water and anti-poverty interventions. Um, and now another pandemic, 100 years later, uh, as devastating as COVID is, it doesn't match up to uh, the Spanish flu pandemic, but it's horrific in and of its own. Uh, our immune systems are not ready for it. They will eventually adjust to it. We will technologically um, hit it with our vaccines and our, our medications. But let's look at what happened just prior to COVID. We had three, four years of a reversal of fortunes where overdose, I'm sorry, where death rate went up. What caused this? Drug overdose. Mm -hmm. So just to put it in perspective, that the level of drug overdose that has happened in this country was enough to increase the entire society's death rate. Wow. That's how impressive this was. And if we took COVID away, we would see that line continue. We'd be up to five years now. And we have not had, if you can look at that, 100 years of data, we have not had five years of in increasing death rates since the 1920s, right? Wow. And so that's how, since wars happen, you could probably find World War II in here somewhere, right? Or the Korea War. That's how big overdose is. It's like a war. 
here's the triple wave, right? So the first wave is due to opioid pills. That's the blue line. The second wave is the heroin wave. That alone would have woken us up and said, oh my God, we've had, we have had this, this paradoxical problem with increasing pill supply and then decreasing pill supply. And there's the fentanyl wave. And that's 2017 data, right? Now we have stimulants coming in um, and we need to be quite concerned about that. But just look, look at that green curve. That green curve shows you, let's see, it's got my arrows to work. That green curve there shows you the acceleration from 2014 to 2017, from, from uh, 700 to 40,000, I think at the time. And, and now we're, we're 50, 60,000 deaths due to fentanyl. Uh, as of the latest data of 2020. You know, that's incredibly, just leave that up there for a second, because it is remarkable to, to visualize it and, and to talk about those numbers. You just said from 700 to 60,000 in 2020. I, I think um, uh, for the 12 month period ending April, 2021, I think it's up to 68,000 fentanyl related deaths. 68,000 fentanyl deaths. So, so, so what we call this in epidemiology is an attack curve, whether it's due to an infectious agent or due to a noxious environmental stimulant, all right, we have an attack curve. We have not seen the top of the attack curve. That's, now that's, that's really an appropriate term. I hadn't heard of that, an attack curve. It's no leveling is. off, no, no slowing down, no, it just keeps going up. And, there, and, and we can talk about the reasons why, why, why I think the fentanyl uh, attack curve continues to go up, uh, but it's impressive. It's 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 five years, four four years in. I'm sorry, it is seven years in, uh, and it just continues to go up. Well, I want to. I, you you mentioned that. I want to get into that a little bit later, like the reasons why. I think you cite something called uh, supply shock. Besides the social determinants, you know, of addiction, we have something that you've uh, called supply shock, and I'd like to. I'd like to talk about that a little bit later, but first, this graph again, you know, you notice over there, the way you've plotted it in 2016, 2017, you see a leveling off and, and even the beginning of a decrease in prescription opioid related and heroin related overdose deaths. So what counteracts that is that almost vertical spike in, in fentanyl deaths. And, um, that to, to visualize that, to see that, lets you know a little bit what we're up against, the velocity and the power of this thing. I'd like you to speak to that. What, what is it? What is it about this third wave, the fentanyl wave, that has added such incredible velocity and power that it's almost a vertical increase in the rate of death over the past uh, four years? What what Talk to that a little bit. Explain that to us a little bit. Sure. So a lot of people have talked about, well, fentanyl is an unreasonably strong drug. And it is. It's 100 times as potent as morphine. Uh, if you think that, that heroin is about uh, two and a half times uh, as strong as um, morphine, then fentanyl is 40x heroin, right? Um, and so even if you are dependent on heroin, and now you get exposed to fentanyl, um, you run an increased risk of overdose. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's step one. That's kind of the obvious one. That's the one everyone is sort of focused on and picks on. But let's think about some other things, right? One is, where did all these heroin users come from, mm -hmm. right? If this was, <clears throat> let's say the opioid pill wave never happened, and all of a sudden, you take the same number of heroin users and expose them to fentanyl. Yes, we would see the, the X rate, or the death rate go up because again, this potency issue. But these heroin users were new heroin users. That's the piece that is not focused on, right? Where did they come from? They were our patients. They were our patients that we abandoned. They were our, our kids and our neighbors who got into medication cabinets, who, who took pills and then became dependent on those pills, yeah. okay? They were, pill users or misusers, if you want to uh, uh, use the, uh, the, the, the CDC's term or non-medical users, I think is the CDC term of opioid pills, they weren't heroin users. And so when they go into heroin, they make that jump over from pills to heroin. And if we think about the size of the population 
that was whatever pejorative or medical term you want to use for the size of the people who were who were not using opioid pills appropriately. It's huge. It's a huge number of people. Some people estimate it to be about 10 million, wow. right? And now you take one good piece of data out there, 4%, it's not a big number, small number, but it's a small number of a large population, 4% transitioned over to heroin, mm. okay? What we see in the heroin population is at least a doubling, or perhaps if we're underestimating that number, some people say it could be a quadrupling of heroin users in the United States during this short period of time. Yeah. So what happens then is you have a bunch of people who are new to heroin, right? And not only are they new to heroin, they're certainly new to fentanyl. And so that just, the physiological risk environment goes through the roof. Because you know, you're exposing people to something they cannot handle, all right? And so if we have, for example, we have gone from maybe we think about this doubling, tripling, we've gone from about 900,000 heroin users, just shy of a million, to a little bit over 2 million. I think the best estimate is about 2.3 million, which is a huge number. I've been studying heroin for over 20 years. And mm. I think about 2.3 million heroin users, my mind blows, right? It could be, could be actually closer to 4 million heroin users, many, the overwhelming majority of whom don't know what they're doing. They're new to the business. They haven't been around the block. They haven't been taught by elders to inject this way or that way, to, to, to go slow, to take small doses, and boom, then the bomb hits. The bomb is fentanyl, right? That's why we're seeing this exponential increase in drug-related deaths, in heroin-related deaths, and opioid-related deaths. Well, it's, uh, it's uh, pretty much uh, like a, a perfect uh, storm. It's a so-called perfect storm, yeah. yes. It's and it's and it's hideous uh, in its in its nature, you know. Back during the period that you're speaking about, I think one of the, one of the variables, one of the things that happened was uh, oxycontin began to be manufactured uh, with a, a consistency that made it uh, impossible to inject and impossible to insulate. And um, there's a, some studies, you know, will. Um, track the rise in heroin addiction with the that newly manufactured oxycontin opioid that people couldn't uh, could no longer inject it and they they switched a lot of them switched over to heroin i i was practicing uh, clinically in vermont during that period and i i can say from my clinical experience that there were a number of of clients who had opioid use disorder mainly using prescription opioids illicitly maintained and they switched over to heroin and they switched over to heroin because their supply or their supplier no longer had um, a sufficient amount of uh, prescription opioids but happened to have heroin and they that was the what, what they, they kind of moved over and began using uh, heroin and then that was their addiction you know it yeah, breaks yeah, I'm glad you brought it up. So a couple of things there. One is um, Oxycontin was an unreasonable drug, right? Mm -hmm. It was packing um, 80 or 160 milligrams of a very potent, very likable opioid mm -hmm. into a capsule, a capsule that was easily crushed, that was easily solubilized and injected. It could be snorted. Um, and um, Oxy is a big part of the story. It's not the only part of the story. There's plenty of other opioids out there other than Oxycontin, but it was a big part of it because it put a lot of medication in one pill. Why? Because it was trying to create a 12 hour pill. And so you're, you're not taking it for minute one or for hour one, you're mm -hmm. taking it for 12 hours. And so it's the, 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 the magic to that pill, the, the technological advance, the part that's patented uh, by Purdue Pharma is the capsule, which slowly eludes the, the medication over 12 hours. Mm -hmm. But now imagine you wanna just crush that pill and take it all at once. Yeah. That's 80 milligrams of a very potent opioid that yeah. somebody is, is injecting. And what do people say about it, right? They say it's heroin-like. Mm. Like people who have known, who've done both say, oh, I love those oxys. You know, I can, I can, do, I can do half of one or a whole one. And it's, it's white light, white heat, referring to the 1970s Lou Reed song where he was uh, using heroin at the time and, um, and, 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 and describes it 
uh, in this in this classic rock and roll um, um, song, a white light right here. They said that was oxy, right? Now we we're part of this response to this opioid wave is oh my god, what are we doing? We're prescribing too many of these pills, and oxy's too crushable. So let's make an abuse deterrent formulation, right? And so. Now you try to dissolve it and inject it, it creates this jelly and the jelly doesn't go in the syringe and it, it works. Yeah, right? yeah. And I, I, I wish I could pull it up. I don't, I don't have the slide in front of me. I'd have to go find it. But, but I show that uh, using Google um, uh, interest data, I can show that people are searching. As they're searching for Oxy, you see, you see this wave up and then it, the wave down crashes at the moment where they reformulate. People are no longer interested in Oxy. What spike do you see next? I correlate it with a spike in interest in heroin. And along oh, with yeah. Seymour Hoffman's death and a number of other rock and roll folks who then die of, mm. of, uh, of opioid toxicity, right? So the oxy story is a big part of this. And we, um, we just happened to write a very early paper in this story of transitions from pills to heroin. It's called Every Never I Ever Said Came True. First author is Dr. Sarah Mars, also here at UCSF. And she wrote a wonderful paper based on an experience that we had in Philadelphia where I was studying heroin. I've always been studying heroin, I've been studying heroin for 20 years. And all of a sudden I started realizing that a lot of the people that I'm talking to last week, last month, last year were using pills. And I started asking questions like, so how is it that you got to heroin through pills? Because that didn't fit in my understanding of heroin. It's like, yeah, people came to heroin through a variety of pathways, but they didn't come all through oxys or, or, or um, uh, hydromorphone, um, uh, the opanas uh, uh, that also got us into big trouble, just like Oxycontin. Um, and I started hearing these stories and, I, and I, I remember getting on the phone after one particular encounter and calling um, Sarah and calling, calling the field leader for my research saying, we're, we're making a shift here, right? Um, a pivot as, as the current term would be, we're, we're pivoting our research I want to know stories of heroin initiation. Mm. And we mm. studied that and we published it as Every Never. And what we heard was mind blowing. And it was so mind blowing. This paper has now been cited. Uh, it's a highly cited paper uh, because we were there at the right moment, the right time. And that, you know, it's an aha moment, I guess, that we've stated in science. Um, and, um, and that paper has been very well appreciated. And it documents the stories of people who say, I was cut off by my physician. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I sought street pills. And then when the street pills became unavailable, um, my dealer, excuse me a second, my dealer um, uh, offered me heroin and I was off to the races. And I said at first I was going to snort it, I was going to inject it. And every never I ever said came true, then I started injecting. Or some people were injecting the oxys and then switched over to heroin as an injectable. So there you have it. I would encourage people to check out the paper. It tells the early story. Oh, I well. will. I will make sure to. I will make sure to uh, read it. And at the end, if you can send it to me, or send me a list of your papers, we can prepare a slide to show at the end of the show to the audience, that so that will lead them to some of your some of your research. I'm sure they would love to love to read some of these things. Wonderful. Um, and I've seen that uh, the, exactly what you're describing. I've seen in my practice. And people, you know, you know, John Kelly from Recovery Research Institute. I had Dr. Kelly on last, last month and we talked a little bit about this. And, um, you know, it, it seems to me, and, and he agreed that, that, that when you look at stigma toward people who use drugs, if there were a totem of stigma, people who inject drugs would be on the very bottom. They are the person who are most stigmatized against. And people don't really understand um, why, why, why a person would inject a drug? I mean, we all have kind of an, a visceral, uh, inborn like aversion toward sharp objects in the sight of blood. And ever since we're kids, when you go for a vaccination, you don't look. And why would somebody want to do that? And when when you when you analyze it and look at it a little bit, you find out that people do it because it's the most effective route of administration. It's the quickest way to end withdrawal, and it's the most efficient use of the drug molecule. People you know, don't understand that. They just think that people inject drugs somehow because, because they like to, when it couldn't be further uh, from the truth. You know, so, so thank you for, for studying 
you know, this, this particular population for 20 years. We, we, need, we need to know as much as we can um, that's based in science about them because they're the ones that are dying um, at an incredibly um, accelerating rate. So I want to um, tell you what, while we're on that, let me just tell you a little bit about why I do that, right? So yeah. in public health, we think about our numbers studies, right? That would be epidemiology. That's the study of populations, right? And it's very numerical based. But one problem we have with social epidemiology is that we can't get to why questions. We can't get to questions of mechanisms because it would make the surveys way too long, right? We can find out who, we can find out how much, we can't ask why. So when the question is, why do you inject? Or why would you transition from pills, which are, you would think kind of safer, right? You know the dose and all that, to this unknown of heroin, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to answer why questions, that's why we do the street-based research. That's why we do what's called ethnography, the study of culture. Mm -hmm. And I love combining the two. I love numbers for the breadth, but I like the stories for the depth mm -hmm. and for the yeah. mechanism. Yeah. And you add those two together, you can make interventions, right? If you only make interventions based on numbers, we've seen this innumerable times. If you do studies based on numbers, I'm sorry, interventions based on numbers, you're kind of guessing at what to do for the intervention because you know who to apply the intervention to, right? But you don't know how. You need the mechanism. You need to understand what people are actually doing out in the risk world in order to intervene on it. And so you need social studies like uh, ethnography or cultural anthropology to get us there. So that's why I combine the two. That's, that's, that's fascinating, doctor. And thank you for mentioning that because to me, to me, that throws light on the harm reduction community. And, and that's the community that's face to face with the people we're talking about. That is the people we're talking about. And those are the people who hear the stories about why. Because people who use drugs trust them because they know they're not going to get persecuted by them. And they tell them why. You know, it's just a beautiful, a beautiful world. And the same uh, with good clinicians, right? We, we know that. Yeah, the, the clinicians yeah. who are good, who are tuned to their patients, who listen yes. carefully, yes. they also get to the whys. And that's why yes. they're better clinicians. Yes, actually, absolutely, absolutely. You know, so, you know, just a, a quote by Lou Reed. I'm a Lou Reed fan, you know. Me too. And I remember everybody putting everybody down and all the dead bodies piled up in mounds. And um, that was from 1966. Mm -hmm. So in 1966, it, I think I said it was China White. There were people dying. I was a kid in the Bronx. My friends were dying. And it was like it was a, 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 like an epidemic of the 60s. Um, it, it didn't come again until what we're talking about, but it had happened before. You know, one of the things that I think of um, often, just as an aside, is, is the, the like the medical profession somehow inundated America with 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 pharmaceutical opioids and I just boggles my mind how they were convinced by by marketing sales personnel that somehow these opioids really weren't that addicting. Does that does that make any sense to you? How that could possibly happen? Well, I think I think <laughs> we've already used this metaphor once. I hate to use it again, but you know there was also a perfect storm in the whole opioid pill wave. You know. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, obviously there's the profit margin, there's the technological advances of being able to make extended release tablets, capsules or capsules like Oxycontin. Um, and um, there was also this perceived need, perceived need that, you know, pain is going up in America it is. I mean- oh, the fifth, the fifth vital sign, the fifth vital sign. We have, we have a lot of chronic pain in this country, yeah. right? Yeah. So between, between the supply and the profit motive, between, between this idea that Americans have a lot of chronic pain, and now you add a kind of a, a liberalization of culture, perfect storm, right? Yeah. The liberalization of culture, meaning that if you, if you listen to the historians like David Courtright, they'll say we've always had a degree of opiophobia uh, for good reason. Right, because because you know history will tell us about when we we made morphine for the first time. What did we see? Deaths due to morphine go up. When heroin came out briefly as a pharmaceutical, heroin deaths went up. So we put heroin back in the in the in the uh, illegal category. We made morphine a controlled substance. But every time we release a new uh, narcotic, is the general term, right? Like when benzodiazepines came out, because we were an anxious society in the 1950s. What did we see? 
we see an abuse wave due to benzodiazepines. When Adderall first came out, an abuse wave, actually, right, we might still be in an Adderall abuse wave. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that, these psychoactive chemicals, when they come out, they're used because we like them and they, 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 they fit a certain purpose and, and medicine makes progress, right? But there's side effects. And one of the side effects is not just individual side effects, public health side effects, and that is increased use, misuse, diversion into the population. And so we have to learn to, to live with that. We have to learn to, 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 to cope with the fact that we have technological advances and we have side effects, technological mm -hmm. advances. We make fast cars, people die in fast cars. So then we put in anti-lock brakes and, and, and airbags yeah. to moderate. And, that, and that's where harm reduction comes in. So I, I know we're gonna talk about that, but, but that's how you deal with these technological advances is we, we cope with them, we learn to moderate the, the, the really bad effects of them. So um, it's, it's almost a history of uh, unintended unintended uh, consequences. Exactly. What's happening. We're always tripping over our feet in terms of unintended consequences of technology. Name one technology that has not had unintended consequences. We can create social media because it was such a wonderful thing. People are going to chat and interface digitally. And now we see it's connected to teenage suicide. I mean, sure, sure. technology advances and, and paradoxical effects. So we have we have 700 deaths attributable to fentanyl over the years 2013 2014. Then up to April 2021, we have 68,000. So the velocity is this way out of control. We have heroin. Um, we still have uh, pharmaceutical prescri prescription drugs, and now we have what you are calling the fourth wave. We have methamphetamine. Let's talk a little bit about methamphetamine and what's happening with methamphetamine. Well, the first thing is we'll go back to the historians and there's this notion, it's a little bit vague, but we kind of have this notion that there's undulations in drug culture where you know we, we seem to undulate between, oh, this was an up decade and this was a down decade. Oh, let's have another up decade. Let's have another down decade. That. So we alternate between you know heroin and then crack comes along and then you know meth slips in for a little bit and then we're back to pills, right? Well, guess what? We've just had a 20 year run with downers. Um, it kind of makes sense that a stimulant wave comes along. And so um, let, let me explain sort of two phenomena with it um, and, and go from there. One is, um, the idea that cocaine and heroin make a great combo. You just kind of have to accept that. That's a lot of research, um, but just accept the fact that when you combine the two, the cocaine just kicks a little bit of that heroin in a more pleasurable direction. That's the so-called speedball. That to me is obvious, it's cultural, it's traditional, it's historic. Um, uh, it doesn't surprise me in the least, the fact that we're having cocaine. And when people say, well, you know, it's cocaine, uh, deaths are going up. Are they purely cocaine deaths or are they cocaine plus heroin? Most of them are cocaine plus heroin and most of the heroin is contaminated with fentanyl. So it's cocaine plus fentanyl. Yeah. Okay. So it's not cocaine itself, right? The methamphetamine is a little bit of a surprise, right? And then that's basically, that's, that's the sink grant. That's what I'll be spending the next five years of the government's money researching. Oh, Why methamphetamine and fentanyl? Why methamphetamine and heroin? Because that's the so-called goofball. The goofball is not historic. It's weird. It's fussy. Um, it's unusual for people to use and only experts use it. Why? Because methamphetamine is so strong, it bowls everything else out of the way. So you wasted your money on the heroin or whatever you wanted to combine the meth to because meth is super strong. It's always been super strong. It happens to be even stronger now. We could talk about that if you want, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. Um, the, the, but, the, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, let's get into that in a minute if you want. but. The fact that half of methamphetamine deaths are co-occurring with fentanyls or heroin is absolutely fascinating. I, I, it's, it's hard for me to impress how fascinating that is. It gets back to your use of the term interesting. Well, as a research researcher, I look at terrible things and they're also fascinating at the no, same I, time. I understand that as, as a scientist, that's, 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 what, that's the way you're built. I understand that. I, I think, think it's uh, fascinating. This, the goofball well, phenomenon is absolutely fascinating. I think Why, that, how, who, what way do you do it? What, how do you overcome the problems that people had in the past? And all of this is, 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 is mind blowing and, and we're gonna investigate it. I will look forward to that study, doctor. 
Uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Rick Rawson, recently told me that on the West Coast specifically, um, methamphetamine is a, a, like I think 80% involved in 80% of the you know uh, drug overdose deaths. Or it's like down really, in LA, yeah. really high. Is that yeah. true? Yeah, it's, it's 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 super high because uh, meth is what we would call endemic in the West Coast. You go all the way back to the the Hell's Angels who were manufacturing, distributing it. Uh, there's something about West Coast culture where methamphetamine has always been part of the mix here. You go to the Northeast where you are, people don't, uh, they've read about methamphetamine, but no one's actually seen it, right? Up, up uh, until recently, that's true. Up until recently. So yeah. now we're seeing it recently. And so what's fascinating, unfortunately, <laughs> is fentanyl is heading to the Western half of the United States and methamphetamine is going to places that it hasn't been before in the Northeast. I, re I remember reading a paper last year about black tar heroin and how because of black tar heroin being popular on the West Coast, fentanyl is difficult to mix in with black tar heroin. So there were less fentanyl deaths on the West Coast, but somehow now they figured out a way to do well, it. So now, you, so now you're tapping into, into my true expertise. There's no one who <laughs> wants to black tar heroin more than I do. I, that's how I started in research, you know, uh, 20 years ago was studying mm -hmm. Uh, black tar heroin. So black tar heroin is not a choice. Um, the country is segregated into these types of heroin. I've spent many years studying uh, the, the heroin flows and, and how the cartels do what they do. Um, um, for, for, for most of this time frame that we're talking about, let's just say the last 20 years, um, mm -hmm. East Coast gets powdered heroin from Colombia and the West Coast gets black tar heroin from, from the Mexico uh, criminal trafficking mm -hmm. organizations. Uh, if I ever use a country I don't mean to blame the whole country. It's the, obviously the illicit elements within that country. Um, that's switched now, right? Mexican CTOs, criminal trafficking organizations, control the whole United States, whether it's marijuana, uh, methamphetamine, uh, powdered heroin going to the East Coast, or black tar heroin going to the But they've kept the cultural divide alive. And that is, uh, it's either through separate cartels or because they've just kept the supply chain the way it is. Black tar heroin still only comes to the western half of the United States. Folks in Vermont are not going to find black tar heroin. Mm -hmm. um, powdered heroin, um, 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 a brownish powdered heroin that, that, or maybe grayish that cooks up like iced tea colored solution. That's what you see Chicago Eastwood and also in the, in the southern United States. Mm -hmm. Texas is divided. Sometimes it gets black tar heroin. Sometimes it gets powdered heroin. Now, I've written a number of papers saying that black tar heroin does this, it does that, it leads to abscesses, it protects you from HIV, all of which were, were, were uh, I stand by. They're, my, they're my, my key papers over the last 20 years. You know, so for example, black tar heroin, because it has to be heated, because you have to rinse your syringes out, because it's sticky, it kills syringes, it kills oh. them very quickly, it causes people to lose their veins, so you have to inject in muscles, all these things decline HIV. So my first, my first um, uh, a big shot paper was in 2003, where I described that HIV patterns in the United States were based on the type of heroin that was available. That black tar heroin inhibited HIV from going into the injection population west of the Mississippi River. And uh, we have a model now that shows that, a mathematical model. Other people have tried to replicate our studies and pretty much agree with it. Now, does that idea translate to fentanyl? I'm not so sure, right? I'm not so sure that black tar heroin can't be cut with fentanyl. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's the current story that's out there, that fentanyl went into East Coast heroin because it's powder meets powder. Black tar heroin is this solid, chunky heroin. And could you put a powder in there? Sure. Could you turn it into a liquid and spray it on the black tar heroin? The black tar heroin would absorb it? Sure. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't been done, mm -hmm. right? And so the fentanyl phenomenon on the West half, half of the United States is different than the heroin contaminated problem uh, on the East Coast. Uh, and, and that, of course, is fascinating uh, in and of itself. So how people are using fentanyl on the West Coast, what forms does it come in? Um, those are open research questions as, as of this moment. Believe, believe it or not, we, we actually don't have a handle on why, how fentanyl uh, in, in the Western half of the United States. We know the death rates are going up. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the West Coast is, is, is late to the fentanyl party. Uh, fentanyl problem started 2014 in the East Coast. West Coast, it's more like 2018. So yeah. four year delay. Yeah. But now that it's here, what do we see? We see that attack curve that we talked about earlier.
attack curve. Uh, that term is going to stick with me. And, and fascinating too. Very, very interesting, um, you know, uh, information that you're sharing with us. I'm sure my audience is going to be very, very happy about this. So fentanyl is moving to the West Coast. Methamphetamine is moving to the East Coast. And what we have is a, like a tsunami, you know, of overdose uh, fatality. Um, I like you, like in, in Vermont, you know, I mean, this great little brave state of mine where we're really getting beat up, you know, and um, we've put everything, I mean, the response in Vermont is exemplary. We have so many programs in place. We've had a compassionate response uh, to people who use drugs. We've embraced many uh, harm reduction uh, interventions. And, and in spite of all that, in 2020, uh, Vermont had the highest rate of overdose death uh, in America. Um, we, 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 we just, um, we're getting beat up with everything we're doing. And um, it's, it's very sad what, what's happening here. Now, we, there's a growing movement in Vermont at this point to implement overdose prevention sites. And it, it seems to be extremely controversial, um, you know, politically, it's, it's very, very difficult, you know, um, you know to, to get support for something like this. But, but it, in the face of all the research, like the Health and Human Services uh, recent report was unequivocal about supporting, you know, setting up overdose prevention sites for research purposes and finding out how they work and where they work. Uh, New York State, our neighbor state, has just opened two overdose prevention sites, one in East Harlem, one in um, Washington Heights. Um, Rhode Island has two. Uh, they call them, they call them harm reduction centers, but they're overdose prevention sites opening in, in March. What, what, is your, what is your feeling about this, like politically and um, medically? What, do, what are your thoughts about specifically overdose prevention sites? you know, with, with the, the, the tragedy that we're seeing in America today? So what we spent the last 40 minutes talking about is a crisis that has hit this country, right? And when you're in a crisis, um, you have to recognize that some of what you've done in the past is not going to work. Now, the first impulse is, okay, we've done this in the past. Let's just magnify it. And, and, and that impulse is good, right? So if we know naloxone works, we just need more of it. If we know that buprenorphine is a, uh, an easier, more efficient treatment modality because you can expand beyond addiction medicine specialists into primary care, we need to expand it, right? So that impulse is good and it's happening. Both of those are happening, but they're not happening fast enough or robustly enough or, or durably enough um, to, 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 to moderate this attack curve, right? And why is that? We have to remember that our main strategy for dealing with the drug problem in this country has been shame and stigma, right? We want to say that's a bad behavior, don't do it. And maybe that works for the, for the, for the eighth graders, right? Maybe that works for, for the young adults who say, oh, well, let me just, let me not, not do the bad thing. I'll just stick to marijuana or something like that, right? Um, um, but shame and stigma bite us in the butt at the, once we have somebody with a problem, right? Because what do they do? They don't show up in the emergency room unless they're desperate. They don't come to the hospital unless they're desperate. They don't seek care because they're embarrassed because they've done the bad thing and now they feel like a bad person. We need to completely unwind that, right? We need to recognize that the disease of addiction is no different than diabetes. It's no different than heart disease, right? Diabetes is a metabolic problem caused by genetics and excessive caloric intake, right? One's behavioral, right? The other you can't do very much about. Mm -hmm. How do we treat it? Do we shame people into changing their behaviors? Not anymore. Maybe we did that in the 1950s or we go back to these medical TV shows, you know, Dr. Kildare or Marcus Welby. They're like, <laughs> don't you realize you're harming yourself, right? We don't do that anymore. They're like, come on in. Let's talk, right? I got medication for you. I got a behavioral counsel for you. How about we do both? Because two together is going to work really well, 
Okay, I've got a nurse who can show you how to inject insulin if we get mm -hmm. there. And I know insulin is embarrassing, but we're gonna do this together, right? Right? Addiction, what, wouldn't it be amazing if we tried to treat addiction the same way, mm. right? But until we get there, until we get the full cultural shift that says, hey, this is just the brain disease, folks. This is just a chronic illness, just like hypertension and diabetes, right? We're gonna treat it with medication, compassion, and behavioral change, right? Until we get there, what we need is to accelerate harm reduction. And if we're in a crisis mentality that says we have a crisis, our knowns are not working as well as we want them to, we need to go to the unknowns. We need to go to the creative level. And this is where overdose prevention sites come in. And Europe and Canada are way ahead of us. So do we really need to reinvent the whole evidence base? No, let's just look at the European Canadian data. What do we see? We see decreased mortality, right? No one has ever died in an overdose pre prevention site. They used to be called supervised consumption spaces or, or supervised injection facilities, right? No one's died, right? Um, 10 years of experience, whether you're Sydney, Australia, or, or Bonn, uh, Germany, or Vancouver, Canada, no one's died in one of these, right? Um, they're medicalized, which means that, okay, we're gonna allow you to use drugs, we're gonna observe you in the moment, and then we're gonna have a conversation afterwards. That conversation can go anywhere you want. You want treatment for your abscess? Great, I'll help you with your abscess, right? Mm -hmm. You wanna know how to get into treatment? I'll help you with that as well. You need trouble, you need housing uh, assistance? We'll help you with housing, right? So it's an attachment game. It's a, it's a retention thing, right? Can we bring people in on their terms and start to engage them on our terms? Our meaning medicine, medicine and public health, right? Mm -hmm. Conversation happens, trust building, retention, engagement, right? Good things happen out of that. Doesn't matter whether it's diabetes, doesn't matter whether it's uh, teenage pregnancy you're trying to, to address or, or drug addiction, right? So as an engagement philosophy, harm reduction works and supervised consumption spaces or overdose prevention sites are the right answer, right? Question about placement or, or, or size or scope or how to pay for them. Those are the challenges, right? The legality of them, right? We need to think about federal rights versus state rights, right? So states in the constitution have the right to administer healthcare. So all we need is the feds to back out of the way and say, okay, this is a state's rights issue. This is a medical and public health provision, just like the same thing we're having with COVID in reverse, right? The feds can't come in and say um, mask mandate. They can't come in with vaccine mandates. Why? Because vaccines are a state's rights issue, right? So California can, can, can do vaccine mandates and, and mask mandates and other states um, won't go there. And the feds can't do anything about it except, you know, they can apply some financial leverage, you know, through Medicaid reimbursements and the like, Medicare reimbursements, right? Why don't we make overdose prevention sites a state's right to issue? Attorney General can just step out of the way, right? I take, I take some of this from Brandon Del Pozo uh, from Burlington, you know, the police chief up there, maybe former police chief, I'm not sure he's still, uh, who said, okay, I from my understanding from all the experts, both locally and nationally, that buprenorphine is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So what I suggest is that we ignore buprenorphine diversion and sales on the streets because people are helping each other, mm -hmm. right? I'm in charge. We're not gonna arrest people for buprenorphine possession or, or diversion. Uh, and that works, at least again, to the degree that some of these measures work, right? I talked with him years ago and I said, we need overdose prevention sites. He's like, no way, Dan, it's not happening in Vermont. Well, guess what? It's gonna happen in the United States. It's too good an idea. And look, our, our, our wonderful colleagues in, in, in New York and Harlem and, and, and Washington Heights are doing it. They're literally sticking their necks out to see whether the feds are gonna chop them off, right? right. And when they don't, right, then San Francisco is gonna open one, Seattle is gonna open one. I hope Baltimore opens three. I hope Philadelphia opens three. I hope Vermont opens them, right? And what are we gonna see? The sky is not going to fall down. People are going to be engaged. People are going to be helped. You're actually going to bring some of your nuisance in issue inside. You're not going to see as much public injecting. You're not going to see as many discarded syringes. So Burlington needs one, and it needs one right away. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that is so encouraging to me, and, and it will be encouraging to my audience also. And guess what? You also will save money because people won't be using the hospital and the ER as much. You're going yeah. to... You yeah, go to ambulances, endocarditis, there's a whole bunch of other diseases. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, you know, save society I, money. So how, mo how much it costs? Think about the money savings on the other side too. And I, I do believe that um, there's money coming into the state from opioid uh, wholesale uh, distributor settlements and eventually the exactly. central family, there will be money coming in. So we're going to try to um, earmark that money um, you know, for the right populations. It's interesting that you mentioned uh, Brendan Del Pozo. I know Chief Del Pozo. I sat on his um, or attended his community staff meetings when that whole change was happening that you talked about, and it was beautiful. It was it was uh, Chief Del Pozo. It was our um, uh, district attorney, uh, Sarah George, the state's attorney. It was the attorney um, general, uh, uh, T.J. Donovan, uh, the mayor, Mayor Weinberger, conspired conspired and said, we're not going to enforce law when it comes to someone possessing small uh, amounts of buprenorphine. And it eventually went to the state legislature and was passed into, into law that it, uh, they're no longer prosecuting for that, which is beautiful, beautiful. The next step here is, as you know, is, is overdose uh, prevention sites. And, and the, the forces are, are mounting, you know, as, as, as we speak. And I do believe that 2022 will see will see one open here. I, I certainly I certainly hope so. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. Can you. A picture of one. Hmm? I can share my slide again. Oh yeah, yeah. So in my I, I give this talk recently uh, to a national audience. This was um, just talking about harm reduction, um, and the slide the photo here you see is of an overdose prevention site this is one of the more famous ones one of the more studied ones in the world this is the insight facility in vancouver mm -hmm. british columbia canada and what you see is booths those booths have mirrors they have uh, uh, clean surfaces they've got syringe disposal boxes you can see them in yellow and on the left there what you see is a counter uh, with a nurse or other harm uh, uh, health professional there could be a doctor, could be a nurse, uh, nurse practitioner, and they're observing, right? And they're assisting. Now they can't assist in the actual uh, injection. I think there's some places that might allow injection assistance, but not mm. in uh, Vancouver. Um, but they can uh, administer um, uh, naloxone if needed for an, for a witnessed overdose. They could give oxygen because again they're nurses, um, and they can also do bandages and 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 wound care. Um, it's a lovely facility. Um, you can see this is it's a fairly large one. They don't have to be this big. I've seen ones that are that are intense. I've seen ones that are in vans. I've seen ones that are a smaller, you know, scale to the size of the population they need. This just happens to be downtown Vancouver where they need a big one. Um, but, but there you have it. Beautiful. And, um, you know, it, it sort of rings of, of dignity and compassion and, and worth. And, you know, you're worth the investment. We're going to build this place for you and it's going to work and it's going to be state of the art because we care about you and you're important. It's like the opposite of stigma. You, you mentioned the that opposite of stigma. In, Nora, in Volkov, Nora Volkov talks about internalized stigma. She talks about anticipated stigma. You know, people with substance use disorder are anticipating being persecuted, prosecuted, punished, yelled at, pointed at. They're not, they don't come out of the shadows easily. Right. Then we have, um, we have here in Burlington, we have Safe Recovery, which um, is, is uh, just a wonderful place where, where clients come and they, they trust the people who work there. They feel comfortable there. They reveal the whys there. They, they just feel at home there. And um, it's a very beautiful um, uh, thing to see, you know, and, um, they, this particular population, and, and I think you'll agree, people who inject drugs, it's really severe substance use disorder, are, 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 are least likely to come forward. And it's part of that perfect storm. They isolate, they inject alone, and they die alone. And um, exactly. with an overdose prevention site, they're no longer alone. So as you said, worldwide, there's never been an overdose fatality. I mean, how successful can you get? Yeah. And, and the other thing I'll say is that this fits into a paradigm shift where we go from a monolithic supply reduction thing. We're just going to try to shove the genie back in the bottle, keep the drugs at the border, militarize, crop spray. We've tried that for 50 years, yeah. right? 
And if, if you look at the economics of drugs, where drugs have become increasingly plentiful, increasingly cheap, and paradoxically, increasingly more potent over time, right? One can only say that it's an utter failure, this, this monolithic. I'm not saying there isn't a role for supply reduction, but this multi-billion dollar complex of trying to shove the genie back in the bottle has not worked. What if we had a multi-billion dollar complex where we manage this like our two big killers in America, which are heart disease and cancer, we put in the infrastructure, the, the, the love, the compassion, the, the wherewithal, the technology, new medications, right? New invitation for people to come in. What if we did that to the drug problem? Yeah. Um, yeah. Quite likely it'll work. Yeah. Because then we could also raise more resilient kids and, and try to avoid these adverse childhood experiences, which lead to adult drug use, right? The fragmentation in our society. We could start to heal our communities. Uh, and make them so that drugs are a manageable part of the culture and not the crisis part of the culture that they currently are. Yeah, I think uh, I think New Hampshire, no, Rhode Island is uh, working toward a, a defelonization law. As far as drugs, I know that Oregon has taken profound steps in you know de decriminalizing possession of, of drugs. Wasn't it Oregon? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And just to be clear for the audience, right, we're not talking about legalizing the substance. It's like everything we do in behavior health, right? Like not, not putting blame, people in jail. Blame the, yeah. the, the, the behavior, but not the person, right? In this case, we can still blame the drug. We can still make the drug illegal, but not the consumption of the drug, right? right. That's where we failed as a, as a philosophy, um, is when we blame people for consuming the drug, we, we create a negative spiral. We need yeah. a positive spiral now where we um, embrace the user um, fully, right? And that could be that could be my teenage daughter or my or my adult uh, young adult son, um, yeah. all the way to the person that has severe substance use disorder. We embrace them, we educate, we hold their hands, we march them through the process. It is not easy having diabetes. It is not easy having diabetes, and yet we don't badger people and make it worse. <laughs> yeah. We embrace and we help. Uh, and that's what we need to do in the addiction field as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think I think that you include. I think you uh, cite Dr. Ju Young Park. Yes. In one of your papers, she was on the show a number of months ago. And I, when I, as I listen to you speak, I think one day, maybe in 2022, I'd like to invite you and Dr. Park on, but specifically to speak about the social determinants. Of, of addiction. To talk a little bit about oh, that. Oh, she wrote an extraordinary paper on that. I yeah. really appreciate that work. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I'll I'll be in touch with you in 2022 and we'll talk a little bit about that. I I want to thank you uh with with all my heart. You know, and uh I've read your papers, not all of them, but I'll get my hands on more of them. <laughs> I've read your papers, I've followed you a little bit and um you know, I just uh, I'm just so grateful that you've, uh, you know, made this your life's work and it's so important uh, to you. And I wanna thank you. I'm, I'm honored to have you on the show. Thank you, doctor. Uh, me too, Ed. The honor is all mine. The pleasure is all mine. I'm grateful for all that you do as well. So thank you for having me on. Thank you. Okay, so to my, uh, my audience, um, we'll see you next time. Uh, we're gonna have uh, Rick Rossin on, who's a, uh, another researcher in this field uh, but, but specific to Vermont, we're going to take a close look at what's happening in Vermont. So happy holidays to everyone. And we'll see you. We'll see you next time. Thank you again, doctor.